Hello, everyone. Welcome to uh, this SOC 2 live stream with my SANS family. Excited to uh, talk about SOC 2 TSCs today. So we'll, we'll give some folks a chance to, to hop in here. Live streams are all about the comments. They're all about audience participation, all about us having a just an open conversation here. So definitely let us know where you're where you're connecting from. Let us know any questions that you have as it relates to this. And, and we'll get into hopefully a very educational session to, today about a topic that I get asked about a lot. Uh, and, and we'll get into that a little bit. But um, it'll be great to see see some of the comments here and uh, folks that are joining as, as we get as we get going here live um, and, and see where people are calling in from. So I've got a couple comments in here, which is awesome. So we'll we'll get into it. Um, looks like we got some folks from Denver, Colorado, which is great. Beautiful, beautiful Denver. Uh, and um, let's let's get into it. So everyone, I am AJ Yan. I am the founder and CEO of ByteCheck, a cybersecurity compliance platform, the only all-in-one solution uh, in the industry where we help people with SOC 2. We help people earn SOC 2 reports. And we'll talk about what a SOC 2 report here is in a little bit. Um, but we built a really cool automated solution to do that. Uh, and I'm excited about what we're building. Uh, I'm also an associate instructor at SANS. I help teach SEC 557, uh, cloud automation for enterprise and, and or automation for enterprise and cloud compliance course with Clay Reisenhoover. Really cool course where we talk about all things automation in the cloud and helping people get rid of the manual aspects of compliance. So it's been a really fun journey for me uh, being at SANS, being a part of uh, this journey and then being able to do events like this. And, and I'm really excited to see all of the people tuning in here. We got folks from Chicago, Houston, D.C., India, another Houston, more Colorado, Minnesota, Canada. This is awesome. Uh, really a global global thing going on here. And, and everybody's here to learn about SOC 2. How amazing is that? Uh, so let's talk about it. Let's talk about SOC 2. And if you have any questions, if you have any SOC 2 questions, even though we're going to talk about SOC 2 trust services categories today, if you have any SOC 2 questions in general, let's drop them in the chat so I can get them answered. And, and this can be your resource for all things SOC 2 that, that, to get your questions answered. So first off, let's just frame up what is SOC 2? What is the SOC 2 framework? Why are we talking about SOC 2 today? And I'm going to tell a story. I'm going to paint this picture for, for everyone here, for those that are very familiar with SOC 2 for people that have never heard of SOC 2 before. I want you to imagine that you have a company. You have a software company. It's growing. Things are going amazing. You are building something very special. And now you have a big customer asking you a question. This big customer, think of Microsoft and Amazon and Google, is asking you saying, hey, like I really want to do business with you. I really want to use your application. However, before I do business with you, I want to make sure that you're secure. I want to make sure that your app is secure. I want to make sure that you have some basic practices and controls in place to protect yourself from a potential breach. And I want a third party to validate it. That's what the that's what the big customer will say to you. You know, have a third party come in, validate these controls. Here in the US, the 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 standard for that, the way that people prove that they're secure to other third parties is by going out and getting a SOC 2 report. You'll be able, you'll, you'll go out, you'll work with a certified public accountant, get a SOC 2 report that outlines the basic practices, controls, and procedures that you have in place to prove that you're secure, to prove that you're doing the basics to be secure. And SOC 2 has really become that de facto standard here in the States that if you're going to grow, if you're going to do business at the enterprise level, you got to get a SOC 2. It's going to come up. You're not going to be able to grow without it. Uh, so uh, it's it's one of those things that most companies, most security professionals are seeing on a regular basis. I have to go get this SOC 2 report. And usually it's high demand. It's like, we got to get this now. We got to get it within the next three weeks or this deal won't close. I'm sure that uh, other people have some questions in here about SOC 2 uh, or, or have experience there where they had to get a SOC 2 really fast. Um, and they had to go through the process super fast because there's a business demand on it. That's usually the customers that that I run into. 
and I and I see one uh, one question here that I'll that I'll um, go ahead and answer now um, about it, it says what other frameworks are easier to bolt on or test at the same time as a SOC two and, and great to see you here David um, David is one of the smartest people I know in the compliance space so if you all don't um, are not connected to David or don't know David I highly recommend um, connecting with him because he's an extremely smart and talented individual in the compliance space. There are several other frameworks out there that um, do make it a little bit easier to bolt on with SOC 2. The most common would be ISO 27001. And there's an important disclaimer here that I have to give. For ISO 27001, the work up front is a little bit more challenging than the work up front for a SOC 2. You got to do a lot of documentation, a lot of building out your information security management system. But when you get into the testing, when you get into what ISO calls Annex A controls, there is about an 85% overlap of all of those controls with SOC 2. So a lot of the work that you're doing in either SOC 2 or ISO Annex A is going gonna, is gonna to be uh, relevant for that. Uh, the other one is HIPAA. There's about 80% overlap of those technical and administrative safeguards and the HIPAA security rule uh, with SOC 2. One of the cool things about SOC 2 that I have found um, is, and really not just SOC 2, all of the cybersecurity compliance frameworks, and I'm sure a lot of people agree to this, generally they all say the same things. You know, they're going to talk about privileged access, they're going to talk about vulnerability management, they're going to talk about pen tests, they're going to talk about uh, vendor management, change management. So one of the things I tell companies all the time, regardless of what cybersecurity compliance framework you're pursuing, just focus on security. Just focus on the basic security things that you should be doing because nine times out of 10, those things are going to relate to whatever cybersecurity framework. There's going to be these one-offs. There's going to be things in SOC 2, things in ISO that are just not general security things that are very unique to those frameworks. But for the most part, you're going to have a ton of overlap uh, between, those, uh, between those frameworks. So my suggestion would be SOC 2, ISO, uh, HIPAA are all things that I would try to do together. If you are if you have to comply with multiple frameworks, consolidation is the name of the game. You don't want to have your engineers going out, collecting data from AWS in January, having to collect it again in June for a different framework and again in August for a different one. Try to make those things line up around the same time of the year so you're not draining operational resources on, uh, on, on, uh, on, 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 the, on your team members. So let's get a little bit into the five trust services categories. Uh, I do see a question here on IoT security. Um, I can feel free to DM me or, or write me um, online. I want to make sure we stay on topic there. I don't necessarily consider myself an, an, an IoT uh, expert, but I have some thoughts there, and I and I can I can share those if you if you send me a message on LinkedIn or, or Twitter. So one of the things that happens when I talk to customers that are pursuing a SOC 2 is I ask them, hey, have you thought about which trust services categories that you want to include in your SOC 2 that you want to have in scope? Uh, and usually the answer is like, uh, I don't really know. I, I haven't really thought about that. Or, yeah, we're going to do the basics. And I'm like, OK, which which basics are those? And they're like, uh, security. We're going to do security, um, which, you know, I get. Uh, but that is. Choosing your SOC 2 TSEs, trust services categories, is what that stands for, is a very, very important decision. This is essentially what you're going to be evaluated against. What are the criteria that your auditors are going to come and look at and say, are you doing the th necessary things uh, to address this particular uh, SOC 2 framework? And there's five of them that you can select for. Uh, there's security, there's availability, there's confidentiality, there's process and integrity, and there's privacy. These are the five, think of them as pillars of SOC 2. These are the five things that you could be evaluated against. And all five of them have underlying requirements, criteria, control objectives, whatever you want to describe them as, has those things um, listed under, under each of those five uh, TSCs. And we'll talk about each of them here. Um, in a second, but it's important to know that there are the five security, availability, confidentiality, process and integrity, and privacy. Uh, and there's a couple um, comments here that I can respond as we're getting into this. The first one is, how does the PCI DSS framework align with the SOC 2? There's some overlap. I've done a lot of SOC 2 and PCI engagements together. There is some overlap there. What I would say, Floyd, is PCI is way more prescriptive than SOC 2. PCI is going to say you have to do X, Y, and Z. 
and you can only do it this way. Your password requirements have to be this way, where SOC 2 is going to give you a set of criteria, set of think of them as objectives, and you have the ability to figure out how you're going to address those. So there could be some areas of the PCI DSS that just don't relate to your company. And I'll give you a good example of that later on, Floyd, where it might not make sense for you to have that in place, but in SOC 2, you can still figure out a way to address the criteria where PCI is really yes or no, up or down. Um, but there are a lot of overlap there too. A lot of the vulnerability management stuff, change management stuff, all overlaps between PCI and SOC 2. Also see a comment here about AC, the AICPA having crosswalks between the TSC and ISO 27001, 853 and others. There's a really good resource out there. Unfortunately, that mapping is at the criteria level. Um, and if you kind of think about the workflow of SOC 2, right? We have uh, at the top, the SOC 2 reporting framework. Next, you have your five trust services categories that you could be evaluated against. Um, those TSC, security, availability, confidentiality, process and integrity and privacy. Underneath each of those TSCs, you're going to have criteria. You're gonna have under security, nine different criteria that say the entity does X, Y, and Z to protect themselves, right? You'll have nine under security, you have three under availability, two under confidentiality, five under process integrity, and another eight under privacy. That mapping that the that Lay, Lay mentioned, or Lee, I'm sorry if I pronounced your name wrong, sir, uh, that uh, he mentioned is mapped to the criteria, which is great because you can see at the high level what, uh, what other frameworks relate to, but it doesn't get you into those granular details of this particular control around security awareness training maps to this 853 requirement in the AC family or the TA or the whatever family, AT family, the awareness and training family in 853. Uh, so you'll be able to get some information, but I would say, you know, don't think of that as your, your, your sole resource uh, that, that you can find. Um, so yeah, let's talk a little bit about security. And, I, and what I wanna do is just talk about what can you expect to see covered in each of these uh, trust services categories. Uh, the first security, security you will find in 99.999, think 11.9% of SOC 2 reports are gonna include the security trust services category. Uh, and the reason why I say 99.999% because it is possible that you can get a SOC 2 that doesn't include the trust services uh, criteria. You can get a SOC 2 against NIST 853, you can get a SOC 2 against really any available cybersecurity framework or standard that your auditor would be comfortable doing an SSA E18, which is the standard that um, uh, underlies SOC 2 uh, that your auditor is comfortable with. But most auditors are going to choose the trust services criteria. And if you do choose a trust services criteria, you're going to have to include the security category. The security category is going to cover all of the things that you would expect in a cybersecurity audit. Vendor management, onboarding and offboarding, risk assessment, uh, change management, vulnerability management, um, logical access. A lot of the technical stuff in your cloud is going to be covered in the security trust services category, which is why it's the foundational category. All of those basics. It's why it's also the biggest category, the biggest set of criteria, because there's so many controls related to general security practices that you'll find um, in that security TSC. Uh, so most SOC 2 reports that you pick up, probably all of the ones that you all have seen in the past have included the security trust services category. Uh, and, and that's kind of the baseline. That's where most people start. Now, the other four is where you start to get into these conversations around which ones would be relevant. And I'd love to hear what people think. What do you think are the most common trust services categories outside of security? There's availability, there's confidentiality, there's process and integrity, and there's privacy. If you had to guess, what are the ones that you think show up the most uh, in, in, in a SOC 2? I'd love to see some of the responses here from folks tuning in. And as we get those responses, uh, I'll, I'll start to, to give the answer away a little bit here. Most SOC 2 reports, you're going to find security, availability, and confidentiality included. Those are kind of the three main ones that you'll always see uh, as you pick up the reports. And let's talk a little bit about availability and, and why that's the case. Availability is the case because most companies that undergo SOC 2 are hosted on the cloud. 
Availability becomes a lot easier when you're hosting on the cloud because there's a lot of native things that you can do in the cloud to meet those availability requirements. Things like replication, things like multi-availability zones, something as simple as when you upload something to an S3 bucket on AWS, AWS is gonna automatically replicate that to out to three availability zones. So there's a strong kind of native control that you already have in place there. So the um, the with with availability, uh, there other things that it will cover aside from the replication and the backup of things like business continuity and disaster recovery testing. Um, something that I think is really important. One of the things that I'd love to see in the in the next few uh, months as we see SOC two reports are when we talk about business continuity and disaster recovery. Are we talking about things like what just happened two years ago with the pandemic? Are we saying how can companies react to something that's going to make them strip away their entire physical operations? Or what are we going to do when people start to try to go back to the office? Don't recommend going back to the office. But if you if you work for a company that's going to make you go back to the office, what are some of the things that we're going to do to keep the business going? And then are we prepared to not to be ripped away out of the office again and go back to a fully remote environment? So that will be covered in availability, testing, the planning and all of that stuff as well as processing capacity. So availability is one of those common ones. I see Carlos that you mentioned there and um, uh, that uh, privacy and availability would be common. Availability is really common if you're hosted in the cloud. I tell companies all the time, if you're hosted in the cloud, include availability and scope uh, because uh, chances are you're, you're probably doing those things and chances are you've made some commitments to your customers around availability, which we'll get into commitments here in a little bit. The other common TSC that I mentioned, confidentiality, is another one. And what people should think about when they hear confidentiality is not protecting data. That's going to be covered in the security category. There's a little bit of that in confidentiality, but that's not what it's all about. For SOC 2, when we talk about confidentiality, what we're really talking about is, are you making any commitments to your customers about what happens to their data when they leave your service? Let's say, for example, your customer, you know, has been with you for a couple of years. They've decided they're going to go with another competitor. What is going to happen to their data when they leave? Do they have to request deletion? Do they have to say, hey, X company, let me get that data out of there. Can you please delete it and provide proof? Or do you automatically delete their data within a certain amount of time frame after they leave? Or maybe you have to retain it. Maybe you have some HIPAA requirements that you have to retain data for over seven years or something like that. That's something that we'll evaluate in confidentiality. Confidentiality is all about those commitments around data deletion, data retention, and what are the practices and processes in place for your organization, which is why it's pretty common, um, which is why people have it a lot, because this has become such an important topic when we think about privacy, and we think about people's data, of what you're doing with their data when they leave your service, and are you doing it in a timely manner? Uh, so confidentiality is really common. Uh, and I'm going to pause there before I get into process and integrity and privacy, because there's something to understand just about choosing these TSCs, even though security, excuse me, availability and confidentiality are the most common. You shouldn't just go out and pursue those just because everyone else is doing it. When you're making your decision, excuse me again, uh, about which TSCs to include in scope, you should think about one simple question, what am I committing to? If I take a look at my master services agreement, if I take a look at my InfoSec policies, if I take a look at any kind of terms of use or anything on the website, what are the things that I'm committing to? So if we go back to confidentiality, right? And we're thinking about the commitments around data deletion and removal. Is there anything in your MSA in that confidentiality section that says, I'm gonna get rid of this customer's data in 30, minutes, in 30 days after they leave the service? If so, you should probably have the confidentiality trust services category in scope. A SOC 2 report is essentially a report and attestation of what your commitments were and do you have controls in place to meet those commitments. So if you're committing to uptime, if you're saying our app is going to be available 99% of the time, not going to be any issues. Um, and if there is, we'll give out some SLA credits or something like that you should have availability in scope because your customers are going to say, hey, you told me that I'm going to have this app available at all times. 
where are the controls to support that? What are the things you're doing from a backup replication, multi-location strategy standpoint to meet that commitment? Um, so it all comes back to your commitments. And that's the, if you don't take anything else away from today's live stream, uh, today's talk on these SOC 2 TSCs is when you're making that decision of what trust, ser trust services categories to include in scope, let's make sure that they match your commitments. Let's not just include availability because everybody's doing it. If you're not, if your app doesn't have any requirement for uptime, if, if it's not important for your customers that your app is working and available at all times, maybe they use it once a month or once a year for batch processing or whatever, you might not need that. And you're doing extra work. You're paying extra money for something that isn't necessarily uh, relevant to you. So it all comes back to your commitments. Um, most people do have commitments around security, availability, and confidentiality, which is why those are the most common, which is why those are the ones that you'll see the most um, in a SOC 2 report. And I see here that a lot of the guesses that um, came from LinkedIn were around privacy. Uh, a couple people mentioned privacy as the TSC that they would think is the most common. And that is so common. Um, people, because privacy kind of has become a buzzword over these last few years, when you think about this stuff, you're just like, oh, privacy, definitely. I care about privacy. Our customers care about privacy. We should be doing things as it relates to privacy. I agree. However, in SOC 2, we really have to unpack what is privacy, what does the privacy category mean in SOC 2? It's not the privacy that you're thinking about, that you have a privacy policy and you're doing those things. Uh, while that's important, the SOC 2 trust service category, the privacy trust service category is all about a simple question for you. Are you a data processor or are you a data controller? Do you actually own the data subject? And when I say data subject, I'm talking about myself. Think about yourself, a person. Um, do Does this company, does this uh, application, does this service own my personal data to where I can reach out to them directly and say, hey, my birthday is wrong in your system or my name is misspelled or my social security number is wrong. If they're like, well, we got that information from your insurance company, they are a data processor. They are not a data controller. The insurance company is that data controller. And the reason why that is an important distinction is because the SOC 2 privacy category is all about data controllers. You're going to have controls around controlling the quality of data. You're going to have uh, controls around um, how do you respond to data subject requests. When I reach out to you, how do you help me get my data or delete my data or tell me how you're using my data? Uh, that's the type of stuff that is going to be covered in the SOC 2 privacy uh, trust services category. Um, and a lot of times what I see are organizations uh, are like, we're going to go get privacy. Somebody at the highest level says, we need to get the privacy trust services category. Uh, and then they go out some auditor makes a ton of money off of them because they were like, yeah, of course we'll do privacy. But then when you actually look in the report, most of the criteria under privacy is not applicable because they're a data processor and not a data controller. Uh, and you want to really make sure that you are not just pursuing something just to pursue it, but you're actually getting value out of it, not just you as an organization. But the number one thing you should think about when it's about SOC 2 is think about the readers of your report. Who are the people reading this report? And what do they care about? They're not going to care about some an auditor writing not applicable 15 times and saying this entire privacy category is not applicable. So don't, don't do that if you don't have to. Uh, the biggest thing to remember, again, for SOC 2 privacy is it's not just about simple data protection. If it's about data protection, confidentiality probably is going to answer a lot of the questions your customers have. SOC 2 privacy really focused on if you're a data controller. Do you control the data? of data subjects. And I see there's a question around here around data subjects. Just think about yourself. Think about the human um, behind the actual data. So I am a data subject. Uh, my data, um, I'm the person that could reach out. There's something called data subject access requests where I could reach out to a company and say, hey, let me get all my information about all the information that you have about me. I want it out of there. Um, that would be me, the data subject, making that 
that access request. So if you're a company and you don't interact directly with those data subjects, if you're not the one making those updates, if you're getting that information from somewhere else, SOC 2 privacy probably is not the uh, category for you. And I do see a lot of companies pursue SOC 2 privacy without really needing it. And it's just a waste of time for everyone involved. Uh, so one of the things that I would, again, come back to your commitments. What commitments are you making from a privacy perspective? Generally, the confidentiality category is, 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 is enough. Um, and the reason why I'm harping on this a little bit is because when we think about the number of criteria, and you all will see this in the follow-up blog that, that I think Laura and is also in the comments of the, this video, the SOC 2 TSC's blog, the privacy category is really big. There are eight different criteria or criteria in privacy. And guess how many there are in security? The main SOC 2 pillar, there's nine. So it's essentially just as big, if not bigger, because some of the details that happens um, in privacy as the main pillar of SOC 2. So you're adding a ton of work into your assessment that just might not be necessary. Uh, so really important that you understand the difference between privacy versus confidentiality and how to make that decision and comes back to that data controller versus data processor thing. <clears throat> now, there's one more category, processing integrity. Uh, a lot of security professionals uh, think when we hear integrity, we kind of go immediately to the CIA triad. We got confidentiality, integrity, availability. Unfortunately, uh, well, I don't know, unfortunately, maybe fortunately, the process and integrity category in SOC 2 is not all about the integrity of your data, protecting the integrity of your data, doing things like file integrity monitoring or log file validation. It's not about that. It's about system processing. So think about like a payroll processor. If you are evaluating a payroll processor, you probably want to make sure that when you put X hour in and you say this person should be paid this amount, that on the back end, the, the calculation is correct. You don't want to pay somebody more or less than what the system is supposed to do. So process and integrity comes into place when your customers care about the completeness and accuracy of the data coming out of your tool. Uh, that's where PI is really important. What I tell customers all the time, you will know if you need process and integrity. Someone either asked you for it or someone cares about it. Someone's asking you about processing and um, whether or not the data coming out of your system is appropriate. Uh, so you will absolutely know if you need process and integrity and the nature of your business will tell you as well. I'll give you a, a, a personal story here with Byte Check. We have a SOC 2 report, which is, which is it's like the inception of SOC 2 because we do SOC 2s. We have a SOC 2. It's SOC 2s all over. And we included process and integrity in our SOC 2 report because we have an engine that does automated testing. People that are using our tool want to know, hey, if I hook up to my AWS environment, if um, and and the byte check engine is going to say that these things are passing or failing, I want to know that it's processing that data correctly. So we included process and integrity in in our SOC two report. Um, so that's one of those ones: process integrity and privacy, not as common as security availability, confidentiality. Those are really unique. They're generally pretty custom depending on the organization. So you should definitely have a conversation. Both of them require a lot of additional level of effort. It's not going to be something that is easily automated. It's not going to be something that is probably quick for you and your team. So you really want to make sure that you've done your homework on which of those categories you want in scope. So I know that was a ton of SOC 2 trust services categories information. Looks like we got a few comments. Um, Carlos has a, has a cool comment here as well uh, that he's been confused about confidentiality and privacy. You're, you're not alone, Carlos. Uh, a lot of people go through that decision making process. And a lot of times it's because executives or somebody above you is asking like, hey, we need privacy. We need privacy. And it's really tough to explain to them like, hey, like this isn't going to be relevant to me. So hopefully the way that I was able to sh break down the difference and, and what you should know and care about helps you have that conversation um, uh, about including the, the SOC 2 privacy trust services category in scope. I definitely want to hear more from people that are tuning in. Any questions, any comments about things that I said that you that you can I can dive a little bit deeper into. But I'll do a quick recap as you guys are, are, are you, as you all are getting those questions in place. So again, we have five trust services categories, security, availability, confidentiality, process and integrity, and privacy. 
those five um, are going to be the pillars that you're evaluated against. Most companies are going to are going to have security, availability, and confidentiality. But that's not just because that's what everybody else in the industry is doing. It all comes back to your commitments. What commitments are you making to your customers that relate to these uh, trust services uh, categories? Uh, and uh, you have to really think about those. Where are those commitments located? They're located in your master services agreement. They're located in your terms of use. They're located in your privacy policy. They might be located in your internal information security policies where you're committing internally to doing things a certain way from a security perspective. Uh, so always think back to that. And that, that's cool to see, Carlos, that you're using the blogs for, for that course. That's awesome to hear uh, that the, the, the blog is getting that type of um, uses, usage out there. Um, as a content creator, it's always tough to know if people are going to respond well to the things that you're putting together. So it's cool to see that you're using it. Uh, and um, again, at, Carlos, as you're teaching, anybody that's watching this, commitments, commitments, commitments. What commitments are you making? Then let's decide on the TSCs. Don't ever let someone convince you to uh, to include a trust services category if it doesn't make sense for your organization. It all comes back to those commitments. Process and integrity and privacy, less common, some very specific use cases if that needs to be in scope. And like Nick says here in the comments, confidentiality and privacy are conflated everywhere, uh, including in SOC 2. Confidentiality and privacy are, are often confused, often seen as the same thing. And I can see it in security. I can see how people can kind of use those words interchangeably, but don't do it in SOC 2 because you're going to cost yourself a lot of money and a lot of time as you're going through uh, the SOC 2 uh, attestation. So those are the five TSCs. Those are the things that you would be ultimately evaluated on in a SOC 2. You, you, you choose which ones you want. One of the things that uh, I often tell people as well is, say in your year one, you decide I'm only going to do security. AJ, we're just going to knock out security. We just want to get security right now. And, and that's going to be the baseline. But year two, you want to add availability. You want to add confidentiality. It's a great way to go about it. Highly recommend because guess what you're showing? Maturity over time. You started with only security. Year two, you started to make some commitments to your customers around availability. So you included the availability and scope. Now you're growing even more and customers care more about data deletion, data retention. So you make some commitments around retention. Then your SOC 2 report continues to grow over the time that you, that you have it, which shows that maturity that you want to show to the readers of your report. And then lastly, on the security and also the availability category, I mentioned this before around the non-prescriptive nature of SOC 2 reports. One of the things that you should take advantage of in both security and availability is that non-prescriptive nature. If you're doing something really, really cool as it relates to vulnerability management or as it relates to change management, your SOC 2 report should reflect that. We should be talking about those controls. We should have things in place in your report that highlight the cool things that you're doing uh, from a security perspective. One of the most underutilized aspects of SOC 2 is the fact that people just don't have custom controls. They don't have custom reports. They're all the same stuff. Every report looks the same. It's all cookie cutter, but it doesn't have to be that way. SOC 2 is one framework where you can get really custom. You can get really detailed. And it's a great way to, uh, to, um, uh, to highlight the strong security practices you're doing at your organization. Don't let your SOC 2 report just be another SOC 2 report. That's a waste of money, a waste of time. It should be unique for your organization, for your technical environment, and have some really strong controls because it's the only report, compliance report out there that you can do that, that you can have a control about S3 buckets. You can have controls about guard duty. You can have controls about really specific cloud security things. And, and I think that's cool. Uh, you know, it's, it's probably a little nerdy to people not in the compliance industry, but I think it's really cool that we can have a compliance report that talks about technical stuff, talks about cloud security stuff, which is super important. Looks like we have a nice uh, comment here from Ben Phillips. Um, hey Ben, hope you're uh, hope you're doing well and good to see you here. 
<clears throat> he mentioned, have you discussed how the system boundaries change if you do privacy and confidentiality? Yeah, we, we got into that a little bit, Ben, where uh, I just try to highlight, you know, what that commitment looks like when you decide to include privacy. It's not an easy uplift. It is a huge aspect of, of, of changing the scope of your examination. Um, and a lot of companies run into it and then they realize like, oh, I bit off more than I can chew. So you have to really critically look at how am I thinking about this? Should I include privacy and scope? Because like um, Ben mentioned, it is a huge factor from effort and a scope perspective when you include privacy and you kind of change between that privacy and confidentiality. The level of work, the level of effort. And when you see anyone in the compliance space say level of effort goes up, think price goes up, cost goes up you are going to, there's going to be an impact. Um, so it's really important to remember. Uh, thanks for the comment, Ben. That's a, that's a good one. So as Laura was mentioning, and, and feel free, you know, we're going to wrap up here in a second, um, give you all some 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 time back uh, that, that have tuned in here. Um, as Laura mentioned, you know, there are a few resources that uh, I have shared out there as it relates to SOC 2. Uh, one of the things that I'm doing with SOC2 and SANS and the SANS leadership team and cloud security team is just get information out there about SOC2. I found when I was learning SOC2, when I first got started in this industry, only information I could find was from the AICPA. And I don't know if any of you have read some of this AICPA stuff, but it is tough. It is really tough to understand. It's really tough to be uh, just explained in an easy to understand manner. So um, we're doing a lot of SOC 2 content here on, uh, on, on through SANS. There's going to be blogs, videos, et cetera, to help you make really smart decisions when it comes to SOC 2. So to support this video today, there's a SOC 2 Trust Services category blog that Carlos is using and, and Laura dropped in the comments. Uh, also, yesterday we did a, a SOC 2 cheat sheet that you can print out. The one I think, and I don't, I don't have any information on this, but SANS cheat sheets are like the greatest resources out there, not just from SOC 2, not just from uh, cloud, but there are some great SANS cheat sheets out there. Um, I cry as well uh, when I do read AICPA documentation, Carlos, so you're, you're not on your own. Um, but there are some great, great stuff out there um, from SANS on the cheat sheet level where you can get a one document a one pager that gives you a bunch of information about a certain technology. I published cheat sheets around PowerShell in the past. I've used the AWS CLI one, and I've been fortunate recently to uh, create a cheat sheet for SOC 2. So all things that you need to know, trust service categories, report types, opinion types, sections of section three, et cetera, those all covered in that cheat sheet. So highly recommend you download that and use that as a resource as well. Uh, we also have some cool content around automating compliance for SOC, automating SOC 2 on AWS. Uh, my background is in AWS. I've done a lot of work on AWS. So I'm producing these short five minute videos that show you how to streamline and a control test and using AWS config and auto remediation rules. So instead of providing screenshots to your auditors, you can just auto remediate, set this config rule and show your auditors that and hopefully save a ton of time uh, for you and your team by doing this. So um, check out the YouTube SOC 2 playlist for some of those videos. And we have a bunch more coming out there as well. Got a good question here. Um, someone said, I'm mostly interested in ingesting SOC 2 reports, evaluating other folks' reports, and measuring a report against out needs for assurance. Uh, there is uh, some really um, key things to look for in SOC 2 reports, Gene, uh, that I think is really important for people to dive into. A lot of people pick up a SOC 2 report and they're like, oh, OK, check the box. A lot of companies do that. I get the SOC 2 report. I'm good to go. But you should really care about certain areas. And um, this is actually going to be a, a future live stream. We'll talk about the contents of a SOC 2 report. What are the areas you should care about? We'll, maybe I'll, I'll print one out and actually have a SOC 2 report in my hand, go old school on it. But that's a really good thing for us to talk about in the future of, of where do I look in the SOC 2 report? What are the things that I actually should care about behind all this AICPA language? Because even in the report, you're going to find a lot of AICPA language. And that's probably something I should mention as well here, that SOC 2 is not a certification. 
SOC 2, you're not going to get a search. You're not going to get some big thing up there uh, that is going to be a search. It's a report. It is a five section report uh, that, or four sections, there's an optional fifth section. Um, so some reports you only see four sections that is pretty detailed and long, you know, they can be upwards to a hundred pages, sometimes, you know, minimum like 50 pages. So you're going to have a bunch of sections of information. It could be overwhelming. So really important that you know where to look and um, we'll dive into that on a future, future live stream. <laughs> some funny comments in here. Uh, uh, that uh, uh, around the socket to me cake. That's funny. Uh, thanks, Zanette, for the for the kind words. Uh, great question down here. You know, what are some other examples of evidence automation that I've seen? Uh, a lot. Uh, well, you know, selfishly at Bite Check, we automate a lot of, of evidence collection. Uh, but I think one of the things that's highly underutilized in all of the cloud providers are the native services to automate this stuff. Um, because they all talk to each other. So Config is a great resource. Security Hub is a great resource. Even Trusted Advisor works for automating evidence collection and making things super easy because it goes out and sees all your resources and pulls that data back in. So I would first start with some native security services uh, and see how is how can I use some of the things that already exist where I already have this information where instead of grabbing a screenshot, I can just show my auditor this report, or I can do this quick dump. In SEC 557, we show people ways that you can use PowerShell modules and you can use um, some really creative ways to go out and collect information on a continuous basis, really living off the land. Uh, that's the whole concept of our SEC 557 course is teaching auditors, teaching compliance professionals how to use the resources, use the tools that their engineers, their security professionals are using uh, to automate this stuff. So Jason, that's where I would start. I would say native services and then go have a conversation with people on your team. What are the tools you're using? Uh, what are Maybe you're using Grafana from a visualization perspective. Cool. We're going to ingest some data in there and display it for you in the same <clears throat> tool that you're using, uh, which, is, which is a great way to do it. I I think a lot of times compliance gets a bad rap because we come in with our own tools, we come in with our own ideas, we come in with all this stuff that is completely different than what our team is using. So instead of them wanting to work with us and actually learn, they see us as a blocker um, and we stop them from working and more efficiently and, and better. So it's important that you live off the land, use the stuff that your people are using and it's a lot easier to get that evidence on a regular basis uh, on AWS, Config, Security Hub, great resources to automate compliance. Great question. Outstanding. So it looks like we're about to be right at the 45 minute um, mark. Uh, and, uh, you know, we're going to wrap up here. I had a ton of fun. I, I love Sam's live streams because uh, I get engagement with the community. Usually after these, I have a lot of good conversations that pop up in my inbox. So looking forward to those. And definitely encourage you all to connect with me um, right there on the screen at AJ on either on Twitter or LinkedIn. You can find me. Um, and I'm pretty open. You know, I'll talk to you. I love this compliance stuff. So uh, you won't be hearing this won't be the last you hear about me from a SOC 2 perspective. We have a lot of great SOC 2 stuff planned. So if you're learning about SOC 2, you're going through a SOC 2 right now. Lock in on this playlist, lock in on some of the SANS content that we're producing, uh, because we're going to dive deep and hopefully empower you all with information that is useful uh, and um, uh, beneficial for for your organization. So thank you everyone for joining. I, I truly appreciate it. I truly appreciate you taking the time to join us. Please visit sans.org. A couple things before I hop off. Uh, we have a new to cyber summit next month. If you're breaking into cybersecurity, highly recommend that conference. It's free. It's online. The networking, the sessions are all extremely powerful. And I recommend you attend that at the end of March. CloudSec next in May. Great cloud security conference where I actually got my one of my first starts um, in, in cloud security speaking at one of those cloud sec next conferences. And it's a really powerful conference for you to learn all things cloud security, also free and online. One of the best things about SANS online trainings are the Slack channels, the Slack instances that are created. 
So you get to join a conference and then everybody that's in the conference is in Slack and you can communicate with the speakers, you can communicate with other attendees. And it's a huge and amazing way to grow your network and just interact with people in the community. So highly encourage you to attend those uh, and check out a lot of the content. Um, you know, there's a lot of great content out there that uh, we uh, have put out across many different topics, extremely valuable um, that, that you'll find uh, valuable. And I, and I encourage you to take a look at. So thanks everyone for attending. I will see you all in the next one. Uh, see you all later. Have a good rest of your day.